This Data Tools and Technology presentation is an STC Toronto hosted event. We've partnered with companies like Adobe, Just Systems, Oxygen, and Quark to showcase their products. The goal is to help you understand how to create, manage, and publish your data content. I'm your host, Bernard Ashwanden. I'm the founder and president of a company called Publishing Smarter. Since 1992, I've delivered a lot of seminars and training classes across North America and Europe. Core focus has been on best practices in writing and content creation. This includes content management systems, XML, and in the past 10 years, DIT has really taken off as a topic of interest. I'm an STC Toronto Community Past President. As such, I'm really interested in opportunities to help STC members stay current with the skills and knowledge that employers want. This is part of the reason for these webinars. In the field of technical communication, DIT is a standard with a great rate of acceptance. To work with DITA, you really need to know what it is and then see how it's used in the leading software tools. I'm going to summarize ideas behind DIT in a big picture way in a couple of slides and then turn this over to the vendors. If you want to work in this area, then the core ideas of DITA should matter to you. There's a lot of vendor support and it's continuing to grow. I'm also finding more clients are converting to DITA or asking that new projects be based on DITA. Job postings for roles like information architect, information developer, even some junior positions are asking more and more for DITA skills. DITA isn't just a way to structure content though. It's a good way to implement best practice. This includes planning and organizing before doing any writing. If you do DITA right, it's easier to create good proof of concept documentation. DITA also includes developing content relationships. It makes evaluating and testing a content management system easier as well. DITA is also about automation where it makes sense. This means automating links, reuse, and even publishing. None of us would build a numbered list by typing 1, then 2, and 3. We don't manually build a table of contents, but we still often manually configure print or online output by showing or hiding information. We manually manage versions for different products, audiences, or platforms. We manually build links between topics. We manually do so much work we end up spending less time planning, organizing, and writing. And really, that's likely what you were hired to do. I want to give you an overview in under 15 minutes, so I'm going to make some blanket statements and simplify stuff. This may mean I gloss over a few things. If you do want more detailed and technical information on DITA, contact me outside of this presentation. You likely heard the phrase DITA before this event. You may have read a little bit about it or seen a demo. All I'm providing is a quick overview of DITA, and then I'm going to let the vendors I work with show you data in active practice using their tools. That should give you a more solid idea of what I'm discussing. DITA has core ideas you need to know about. The map is used to plan, organize, and publish. It manages and organizes topics into a parent or child relationship. The map can also be reorganized anytime with little or no impact on writers. The map also uses relationship tables. This supports links between topics beyond parent and child relationships. When topics should link to each other, it's done at the time of publishing, not within topics by writers. The core content writers create are the topics, and these are organized into task, concept, and reference. Tasks are largely information on how to do something. Concepts give you background information on why you may want to do certain things. References often have technical specs. DITA also has specializations. These allow you to build your own topic types beyond the defaults of DITA. This is done when your content won't fit into the task, concept, or reference model. Lastly, behind all of this are the attributes. These define properties for all things DITA. This means you have a way to identify almost anything with metadata. For example, the audience, platform, or product. You can then conditionally publish or display content based on those attributes. Instead of just discussing maps, rel tables, and topics though, let's explore DITA using a very simple document set. Imagine you have to write a manual for a word processor. The manual being written is for new users who understand using a computer but haven't used this product. A bit of brainstorming and a collection of topics are identified. This includes a lot of information on how to manage files. We initially decide to write about how to create, import, save, open, and close. Now we have an idea of the topics, but not of their type. What I mean by this is, we know we want to write about things. We don't know if they're task, concept, or reference. It's possible that some content even bridges the topic types. 
To make sure we arrange topics well, we really need to plan an overall document, not just the individual topics. To that end, we need to identify a goal for the user, and then write to support them in achieving the goal. Depending on your background, you may want to consider the basics of a map to be similar to an organizational chart. If an organizational chart isn't your thing, then maybe consider it to be more like a table of contents. It's really a matter of what's comfortable for you. In essence, we have topics and relationships between them. Each topic is still a standalone unit of information. This map addresses how to manage files. It has topics based on the brainstorming. These are assigned topic types and put into a hierarchy for use within the map. Here there's a concept explaining what we mean by managing files. The file name has C underscore in the name of the topic. This is an arbitrary decision in the naming convention that I've decided on. The map also contains a task on how to create a new file. This concept has two tasks detailing how to save a file or how to use save as. In this map there are subordinate entries, but to the writers it's just another set of tasks. A writer may not even know the order of the content or if the task is used in another map in a totally different context. The writer simply focuses on writing excellent content within a task. We have a reference on supported formats and tasks on how to close or open files. What we have, therefore, is a map, and that map outlines where the topics are and develops the initial relationships between them. The concept on saving has two tasks that are directly related to it. This may change later, but it's a good starting point. Now, what about the task where we explain how to create a file? Generally, if a user creates a file, it might make sense that they want to save it. If you put the link into the topic, then the management of the link becomes an issue. Watch this. Every time writers address file creation, they need to include information on save and save as. Manually managing these links becomes a lot of extra work. Then someone decides to link back and forth between the reference on supported formats and how to open files. While looking at the links, a writer may see a reason to link in one direction only from closing to opening files. Maybe it also makes sense to build a few more links. As an author, what do I know about how the topics are managed? So I add a few more links to a few more topics. Now it's not clear at all about where to start or end. Who knows if I'm coming or going at this point? Writers haven't even started to write yet. Linking can quickly become far more involved than just the parent-child, and a real headache to manage. To make all of this a little easier to work with, Ditta uses something called a relationship table. This is used to manage the links between the topics. Management's pretty simple. Content is put into cells under main headings. Anything in a cell may end up related and linked. For example, three tasks could link to each other. In this sample, the same rule is applied to rows. Now there's a link between tasks and a shared concept. The tasks end up linking to each other, and they also link to the concept. This makes updates easy. Change a rel table, republish, and new links are created. Attributes can be used to further configure how links work within a rel table. But the links in the rel table are specific to a map. Reuse a topic in another map, and totally new rel table rules might apply. This means that you have unique links based on the use of the topic, not on anything that's hard-coded into the topic. There's no internal links managed by writers. No one has to remember to add a section titled Related Topics and then manually add and manage links. Instead, the links are managed by the rel table or implied by the map hierarchy. If the rel table is updated and a single reference is added, it could impact many topics at once. Here, three tasks, the concept, and the reference link to each other. This is done by updating a single entry. Without this workflow, a writer ends up manually opening every topic and managing the link. Planned content, though, still does need to be written. In this sample, topics have a title and a short description. To further visualize how DITA benefits the writer, let's explore a couple of specific examples. A task titled Create Documents is written and a short description added. When published, this is in the PDF, help files, web pages, or any other output that's created. If the map we originally looked at is published, then the task on how to create a document displays this brief title and short description, as well as some basic steps. Now admittedly, what we see isn't all that impressive, but over time, the text can be further developed. 
writers create source content, publish it for review, and then add updated information as a subject matter expert provides it. Of course, along the way, plans change. This map shows where we started. Note the child task Save As. In this sample, map updates change the relationships by modifying child topics. The change here is to update the concept on Save As. It now has a subordinate reference. The writer is free to continue to write. There's no need to manually maintain links or the hierarchy. That's all planned and managed elsewhere. Now an updated map and a new rel table exist. The concept is populated with a title and a short description. When published, we'll see a real change from the first task, which had no initial links or rel table support. Remember, the writer just created a title and a short description. When the map is published and the concept seen with all the associated links, it's a far more impressive document than the first task was. The links are all created because of the hierarchy in the relationship table. This isn't because the writer did a bunch of extra work, but rather because documents are planned. Lastly, if we need to create content for more than one audience, we use attributes. This is the same map, but now we add to it. The task on how to delete is defined for the admin only. We haven't seen it when publishing for a user. When the publishing is done with this audience specified, we're going to get new output. In the output comparison, we see the first excludes the administrator content. It does not include the task on deleting a document. The second output includes all the content. Again, this is simple to do when working with DITA. The map is converted to PDF, help, or web content using a published profile that specifies all properties. So to recap, in DITA, the map is used to plan and organize content. It might use a rel table to further manage and define the relationship between topics. The author creates content such as tasks, concepts, or references, and they're used by the map. Attributes are applied as needed throughout content. Let me wrap up with a case study. We manage a documentation project using DITA for a mining client. To begin, we build maps and topics with a title and a short description. This is published and approved. Once done, all the topics are identified and content is in the right order. Topics have instructor information and student information, meaning two audiences. Using attributes, we define some content as being a superset for the instructor. We create PDF and help content from one map. So there's four finished guides, all planned from the start. Writers create content for review. Feedback's quick, and every week we republish the map. Automatically, we have a PDF and a help file for two audiences. Four documents are delivered. The client can see the full scope of the documentation. Change requests are minimal, though. We catch them on a topic level, and the writer adapts content almost immediately. At the project end, we have a PDF and help material. We have student and trainer materials, and we even provide a slide deck based on the topic titles. Any changes along the way are managed on a map level, and writers don't get involved in that detail. They write. They do it well, and they do it quickly. The net result is this. The client gets professional materials built with feedback from their teams and customized for use in paper and online formats for both the student and the instructor. In addition, we work faster and we deliver a higher quality result. In order for DITA to really work though, there has to be something beyond all the tech specs and ideas. There has to be a way for writers to actually write. There has to be a way for content to be published, distributed, managed, edited, and generally maintained. And that's where the software from vendors comes in. Hopefully this demonstration's given you a bit of an overview of what you can do with DITA. Thanks a lot for participating and watching. I'm going to turn this over to the vendors though in order to show you how DITA works with their tools.